Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks very much for joining. Um, this is one of a number of sessions that we've been running over the, over the first two days here at Expo, and we've also got a program tomorrow morning. Um, lots of interesting topics here. We're going to particularly focus on debt and finance. For those who don't know me, my name is Richard Betts. Um, I'm the, the publisher at uh, Real Asset Media, um, and I'm in charge of all of the content, and we run Real Asset Impact, which is focused around ESG, sustainable investment, purpose-driven investment, and kind of social value initiatives and those kinds of things, um, as well as Real Asset Insight um, that covers I guess the main markets, the main sectors, but looking much more around the sort of thought leadership, strategy, research, analysis, the kind of things that will be driving the markets. So in general, we're keen to look forward rather than backward. And we also produce the Expo Day. So comments that are made in this, we, you may well see in the Expo Day tomorrow or alternative possibly pictures of yourselves here. So who knows? Um, good. Um, we're going to start with a quick presentation here from um, Irina from InRev, um, just, to, just to put some context into it as a kind of framer for the panel. And then we've got an open discussion here um, with a really great panel. So, um, but we also would like your views, your insights. So it's an intimate space, so do feel free to share those. And also welcome to everybody who's joining online as part of the on-demand program that we're running live from Expo Real 2023. Um, over to you, Irina. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, I have a privilege to be here and give a bit of a talk about the current markets. Um, what I have decided to do is talk about both the equity and the debt because it goes hand in hand, needless to say. I think if you look at this chart, it just depicts very clearly the performance that we have seen over the last few quarters. And in the end of uh, 2022, we have seen the sharpest capital markets driven correction since the global financial crisis. Why was it painful and will continue to be painful? Not only because the interest rates corrected so sharply, but also how fast that has happened. Now, there is a little bit of good news. If you look at the red line, to the right-hand scale, that's the average leverage in the European fund index from INRA, which covers somewhere between 350 to 400 funds uh, during each period. And what it has shown is compared to the global financial crisis, our industry has generally the leverage. So it's now at an average of 23% versus what was 40% at the top of financial crisis. But there are challenges. This is one. Let's look at how the correction is panning out. And here you can see very clearly the gap between the UK performance, which is leading the correction. You know, you have more frequent valuations. The sentiment is taken into account much more openly by the UK values. They are much more ready and prepared to take the hit versus this uh, continental markets where the kind of traditional long-term and slower view um, is uh, taking place when it comes to valuation. Now, that works against us because it stops the capital markets or transactional market to take off because most of the investors are sitting on the sidelines saying, look, I know there's more correction to come through on the continent. I'm not going to go back into the market. I want to see that come to fruition. Now, if you think about us as an asset class, we have quite a bit of a challenge. And our investment intention survey has clearly showed that particularly for European investors, there is a denominator effect at play because the other asset classes, such as equities, corrected already. And we are still looking in rare new mirrors when it comes to pricing. Now, if you combine that with where the interest rates are at, and understand that we're now competing not only with other real assets, but also with fixed income. We have to be conscious about the capital and allocations going forward. I also want to highlight one very important trend is that there is no kind of uh, one paintbrush approach to the correction. There's lots of differences across markets and segments to the degree of correction that has already taken place and what's yet to come. So we already talked about UK and how it's leading the correction. 
we have seen very significant changes in pricing when it comes to industrial logistics. You can see that very clearly across the board. And that's again driven by that capital markets correction because the prices were where they were. Yield needed to readjust to the current interest rates plus the kind of implied rental growth kind of been wiped out. If you now look at the retail sector, we see quite lots of differences. UK market now starting to be back into the positive territory after quite a few 15 to 20 quarters of correction. While on the continent, particularly France and Germany, depending on which segment or pocket of the retail you are in, there may be some correction to still take place. One more thing to highlight is the extent to which the outlook for offices is weak and worsening, including in the UK, where you, know, you see for yourself office uh, performance is negative pr pretty much across the board, uh, and that's a consistent message. So back to the case for real estate as an asset class. I think we have to be very realistic that as the interest rates normalize, and you know, I don't think we are far off from that point, they will normalize at the much higher level. Those levels that used to be the norm because before we had the uh, long uh, quantitative easing. And that means the kind of the old easy flow of money, which was off the back of a premium on the top of interest rate, is the thing of the past. And we really need to make the case for real estate as part of portfolio, as a diversifier, as a steady income producer, as well as potential partial inflation hedge. Just let's make it more fun. We also have the ESG a dilemma uh, to, to, to cater for. This is a pilot project that looks at the asset level across Europe. Um, it covers about 25 billion worth of assets, 1,000 by number. And I'm just looking at the carbon intensity and the cram pathway. And I think the picture is very clear. If nothing's going to be done based on 2020 data, by the year 2030, 48% of assets will be breaching cram pathway. That goes up to 78% by 2050. That's if nothing gets done. So the message is simple. We need to do something that means capex and it needs to be upfront. There are some good news on the debt side in that, okay, there are many challenges in the market, but we've seen this before. You know, we can work it through. We learn a lot from crises. The good news from our debt vehicle universe, which is, of course, uh, non-listed debt for real estate, we have seen quite a lot of growth. Since the global financial crisis and in the last three years in particular. So, the lending gap which our traditional banks are creating can be at least in part filled by the private debt lenders as well. If you look at again the investment intentions and what investors are planning to do in the next couple of years or so, they are really actively looking to increase allocations to private debt. I'm not surprised given where the debt is and the capital stock and where we are for risk return perspective. So 62% of investors said they are planning to increase allocations to private debt in Europe. Interestingly, as the investors are selective or careful when it comes to uh, making investments, the debt uh, in terms of origination has clearly been focused, at least in the private space, has been focused on direct lending. What does it mean? Selective, bottom-up approach. So again, coming back to my message that there will be lots of differences in terms of trajectory of correction and subsequent recovery. And to conclude, uh, I think for the debt, uh, private debt, I think there's lots of opportunities in terms of servicing the gap when it comes to uh, financial or refinance, uh, refinancing opportunity. Uh, there's, of course, been a lot of focus on the senior debt, but I think that may change depending on what the investors will view the trajectory of correction or recovery will be. It's very attractive risk return profile. Uh, and it is an unregulated market for now. There is a lot of play field, although there will be things that will follow SFDR or AFMD or uh, also borrowed from the green bonds. But it also is a strategic uh, opportunity to step in into ESG focus space. 
So to bring it all together, and I think we'll discuss a lot more in detail on the panel, I think the out outlook is muted, okay? We need to remember and remind and rethink, be very clear and educate asset allocators about what is the role of real estate in multi-asset portfolio, and we need to do it cleverly, okay? I think we need to worry about capital flows going forward with recognizing that European investors are likely, at least temporarily, reduce allocations to our asset class. The role of debt, I think the growth of private debt is good news. It's more diverse, more competitive market. There is an opportunity to evolve. At this point in time, it's uh, catering the need, catering the gap, and there will be probably more ideas coming through as we go through uh, the current crisis. I am concerned about this location from fundamentals, given it's a capital markets driven correction. I am concerned about structural differences and issues, particularly in the office segment, uh, the tenant demand changes, and this CAPEX retrofit requirement for, uh, to meet the ESG targets. And we are definitely through a period of transition with some known unknowns, such as the 2030 net carbon targets, wall of refinancing, uh, which we potentially may fail with the private debt, but that's not going to be enough. And uh, other unknowns, such as, you know, we've seen a war in Ukraine erupting, disrupting the uh, energy pricing and really facing that on a day-to-day -day basis. But again, the message that I want to leave you with is the trajectory of recovery will differ not only from market to market, sector or subsector, but also asset. And we see that already in the numbers. So navigating the rough waters through bottom-up approach to investment uh, would be my idea of how to get through the next couple of years. Thank you. Great. And uh, your work here is not done, Irina. You, Thank you. you. You need to join us on the panel. Um, let, let's just do some quick introductions. Um, you didn't mention too much about InRev, so let's just do yeah. 30 seconds from you and InRev, and then we'll work our way down. Irina. Yeah, sure. Um, so InRev, uh, my name is Irina Polipchuk. I'm Director of Research and Market Information at InRev. InRev is a non-profit European organization who is catering for investors in European real estate to drive transparency, consistency standards, and data at your hands so you can make better decisions. Great, Carolis. Uh, Carolis Adlis here. I'm the Executive Director of International Investments at WP Carey, based out of London. The WP Carey is an American REIT, listed in New York. Been around for 50 years. Uh, we are sales leasing specialist, long income buyer, cash flow business. Okay. Asad. Hi, I'm Asim al I'm uh, head of the international origination of Berlin Hip. We are part of the LBBW group. Uh, loan portfolio of approximately 30 billion, active in France, Benelux, Germany, of course, and Poland. Uh, Duke Omoog, I'm with Seabury Investment Management since 2011, roughly, and uh, 20 years in the industry. I'm heading the Treasury and Debt Finance Department on uh, Seabury Investment Management, uh, where we manage approximately 45 billion assets under management, and I'm responsible for the loan book, which is around uh, 10 billion in loan, total loan runs. So very interesting. We've got uh, both the banking side, we've got um, the, the borrower side, um, different types of lending, alternative lending, and obviously as well, you're there looking at what the funds overall are doing in terms of the, the debt side. So, so very interesting. Um, let, let's, let's, we'll drill down into some of those topics for certain. I wanted to just start on the um, interest rates, not necessarily where we think, what, what we think, not predicting where it's going to be. Um, but how have the interest rates influenced the real estate market so far and how are they going to do that going forward? I mean, if we take the sort of idea of that it's going to potentially be higher for longer. So I guess what are you putting into your models? What are you thinking ahead in terms of interest rates? Who wants to start with the... Happy to start. Yeah. Happy to start. Um, we are a long-term investor. So for us, the base rate, the swap rates is very important to put in a long-term underwrite. Um, now, quickly looking back to summer last year, what was the real challenge for us was not only that interest rates were rising, but that interest rates were rising more rapidly than the market was expecting. So if you have a base rate today that you put in your underwrite, and actually within a week, within two weeks, the market is changing, that is incredibly difficult for a real estate investor to have a long-term uh, return, to calculate a long-term return. 
Now maybe to your, to your second point, uh, Richard, what do we expect? I think in terms of where we are in the cycle, um, we have definitely entered a next phase since the ECB announced that it was their most likely final hike with interest rates being at 4%. Um, I think it's definitely higher for longer. We have probably reached a certain new normality which might take a bit longer than the market is expecting. But to have, in Euro at least, swap rates five year at 3.3 or 3.4 or trading in a certain bandwidth for another 12 months is at least some normality that we can work with. Yeah. Okay, good. And I guess, Asem, from, from your point of view, uh, you know, as Duca mentioned there, rates went up very, very steeply in a short period of time. Um, I, I guess, how do you see that? What are the challenges that you see with that rate? Or do you think there'll just be a new normal that people will get used to? There may be a bit of pain, but it, but it will be adjusted. What's your sense of that? Well, it really depends what we're talking about. Um, um, the correction is still in course. I think we've, we've seen it, for example, in Germany and in the, in the, in the correction rates in, in, in office and, and retail. So we, we're still not there yet in a consensus where the right pricing is, right? So um, that's part of the, uh, the answer to your question. The, the second thing for us is uh, um, we, we see that many of, the, of our clients have been quite wise, so to speak, in, in their way of, of foreseeing that they will have to put in some more equity to, to stabilize their investment. So in, in eight of, out of uh, 10 cases of, uh, of uh, uh, covenant breaches, we see there is a willingness to, to, to find a solution in that way. Um, we also subscribe to the view that it's higher for longer. We, we, we agree to that. And uh, in that case, we uh, will use pre uh, preferably the, the, the cash flow to, to deleverage the, the investment and uh, to find a solution with the client. In, I'd say in, 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 in one out of 10 or one out of 20 cases, we will uh, encounter difficulties and, and we'll have to work out that, that difficulty in some way. Yeah. And is there any kind of broader fear of things like uh, capital that may have been looking at real estate then beginning to look elsewhere because the returns aren't as difficult? Is that a challenge that you're kind of potentially seeing? I think that's... My, I personally would be most, uh, mostly concerned about that issue, equity leaking out of the real estate market. But I think my neighbor can, can answer that more easily uh, as he's dealing with the equity side. No, of course, but I, I think you asked what's the impact of rates. And I think if anyone did any basic finance course, you know that the rates directly affect the valuations of real estate. So what we notice is that the, 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 the pricing of the real estate transactions has not managed to follow the, the speed of the, the increase in the base rates. And why would anyone, you have to look at debt as investment product. So you can place your money into debt or you can place your money into real estate. If suddenly rates are going higher and you can get better rate at you know, treasury, so you get a better rate in debt, why would you buy real estate? So naturally, pockets of money that can deploy into public markets, private markets, debt, we see they'll choose where you can get best return for the money. And real estate is definitely lagging, especially in Europe. Europe is always known to be slow to adjust to the rates. And Europe is definitely lagging, and that's why there's lack of transactions at the moment. That's why the sellers are slow to react to the to the to the banking rate. So it's very very directly affecting. Okay, good. I'm going to come to you in a minute, Arena. But I, I wanted to check in in terms of liquidity in the market, because obviously that was a real challenge um, in the financial crisis. That liquidity just disappeared, dried up. Um, what's your sense of that at the moment? Is there because obviously you're acting globally as well. So, are there differences that you're seeing, you know, between U.S. banks, Asian banks, um, European banks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we definitely try to monitor the trends. Um, after global financial crisis, the central banks pushed so much liquidity into the market. I think clearly now, with all the quantitative easing programs coming to an end, instead of billions coming to the market via the corporate bonds, the government bonds, it's suddenly leaking from the market. So I would say the impact from the central banks, but the combination of uh, syndication market still being on hold, the debt capital market still being struggling or at a, at a higher cost. Obviously, if there's no transactions, then there are no prepayments and every borrower will ask a bank to extend. I think a combination of all, and all of that is leading to a lack of liquidity in the market and liquidity becoming scarce. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, good. Um, and uh, I just wanted to pick up, I suppose, on on some of the some of the points that that you had there. Um, in terms of the 
alternative debt side, um, it looked as though there were more people coming into the market and so therefore maybe some of that debt cap will be absorbed by funds coming into the market. Um, what's your sense of that in, in, in terms of, I suppose, new players coming in? Well, I think my message is there has been a lot of growth. Can it replace a traditional lender? Is it looking for the same product? Uh, is all that needs to be refinanced is going to be refinanceable? No. So I, I, again, back to the point about being selective. And I think we will have some stress. We will some, have some extend and pretend, or pretend and extend, whichever way you rather. I hope at this point I'm hearing that people are still sitting down around the negotiation table. and There is not so much of giving back the keys. Uh, so hopefully that will be the way forward. But I think ultimately there will be a little bit of distress coming through. Whether that's going to be a wall, I, I doubt it. But that, that's the take. Okay, good. And, uh, go ahead. and I'm so delighted that Irina didn't say that, you know, that would replace the... <laughs> no, I mean, I'm so. a friend to the you know. <laughs> no, there, 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 there's enough of the cake left for everybody to <laughs> take, right. a, take a piece. Um, I would contradict, though, the, the statement that uh, there's less debt available. Um, all the, the banks that I've talked to, all the, all the colleagues that I've talked to, um, the German bankers, are, um, they're all actually um, sub-producing their targets. So, I mean, the... the uh, Berlin Hip is in the same position we are in the, in the starting blocks and we are uh, available for new uh, transactions, but there's just little transactions going on. I mean, don't forget, uh, markets are down in terms of investment volume by two thirds on, on all the major markets in Europe. Um, and uh, yeah. that is reflected in, in our activity. So yes, a larger, uh, to a large extent, it's a refinancing. And to a large uh, extent, our uh, job is to to take care of our portfolio. But we're open for new business and, and I think all the, 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 the other banks, uh, the German banks, are, are in the same position. Yes. Yeah. If, I may, if I may respond to that, um, I do recognize that. I think overall in the market, globally, as, as to your question, Richard, liquidity is, is, is scarce, there's absolutely less liquidity. Um, many parties on both equity and debt are, are uh, affected by the dominator effect. But if you zoom into the individual banks or the type of banks specifically, then I think the U.S. banks are clearly affected by, by the negative sentiment in the U.S. And we really need to make a distinction between markets, between asset classes. Yeah. Uh, that's the same on the bank side. So I think um, a bit negative on the U.S. banks, also those that are investing in, in, in lending in, in, in Europe. I think the international corporate lenders, they were in particularly in the second half of last year, um, uh, reaching their real estate caps, maybe even in breach, uh, a bit depending the bank. Uh, that seems to be in, in, in calmer waters today. Um, the German Pembry banks, what I've heard at least, they are much better positioned um, uh, today compared to after the global financial crisis, but also their liquidity model seems, seems to work. So it's really about uh, the nuances, and that would definitely be an advice to the audience, is to really zoom into the differences of the type of banks rather than to each individual bank before you approach with a refinancing request. Okay, good. May, um, I ask, yeah. may I ask how much of your business is new loans versus refinancing? Because I would guess primarily most of it now is refinancing rather than... Absolutely. Well, as I said, I mean, the, the, the market is, is uh, people, a mirror to our activity. People say, you know, there's availability of debt, but how do you know availability of debt if there are no deals happening? Yeah. If there are no deals happening, you don't know how many people need that. And of course, you say there is that. And the rumors I hear, and WP Carry, we are not like with the buyer, so we don't need asset level debt, we issue bonds. But the rumor on the market is that there is no debt. And if there is debt, the debt is the terms that are, doesn't, the numbers don't work. Uh, the, the, I can the, the respond to that, I think the type of products that we have is either it's a separate account, which typically we're using leverage, and for every transaction, leverage needs to be accretive. Okay. Yeah. Now, obviously, leverage is not only there to drive returns, it's yeah. also to act as a balance sheet or as an inflation hedge, as Irina already pointed out. I think if you want to have it working as a balance sheet, then ideally at fund level, you have arranged that. Now, we have quite conservative approach towards leverage, and even on some funds, we're below our target level. So even in today's market, we arranged that from international uh, relationship banks, who put in more money to the table to create the balance sheet for new opportunities. I think that, that's really what, what the borrower should be doing today. 
and that's the debt that we raised was really for uh, international corporate lenders, okay. European. And from your point of view, Carlos, from you know, in terms of the sale and lease back, um, in some ways, where there's distress coming into the market, where it's a slightly tight financing market, or people are unable to refinance things, um, is actually a, a solution for that potentially and an opportunity is sell and lease back in order, you know, as an alternative lending form. So does that mean you're gearing yourself up <laughs> um, for sort of more activity in 2024? When do you see that coming through, really? It's a wonderful question. <laughs> no, 100% it's true. Uh, we definitely see an increase in inquiries from companies and potential sell lease back coming to market where, you know, they contemplate to do a sell lease back, sell a portfolio of the assets, collect the money out of the sales by proceeds and repay the debt. And they have bonds maturing. We had one specific deal we worked over the summer. They had bond maturing in autumn. They wanted to do a sales but had tight timelines because they need the money to repay the debt. And typically a lot of sales back are based on assets like manufacturing, where for us they sign 20 year lease. It's a big strong credit, mission critical. Without that asset, the business does not operate. So for us, that's a perfect investment. But very few banks are willing to lend on manufacturing. You'd probably lend more on nice sexy warehouse or an office or something like that so for us that's perfect opportunity so we are definitely gearing up to be a lot busier but if you ask me are we super busy now doing sales leasebacks today that's not true i think it takes time for them to come and uh, i mean is that true generally do you think in terms of the you know if we're going to see distress it's going to take time to come through and it's going to be as those refinancings comes through or obviously we've seen here in in germany you know issues around that and particularly around the mezzanine area for example um, so I, I guess will those create issues or is that you know is there going to be an element of extend and allow the market to adjust a little bit what, what's what's the sense of that I mean it is different to the global financial crisis for sure but, but do we expect to see distress coming through I think things will get a bit worse before they get better uh, will it be the same level of distress as in the US no I personally don't think so um, but yeah that probably from lenders, investors, it will be, the pressure will increase uh, and definitely the refinancing risk is the big, biggest risk on, uh, on, uh, on the investor side. So yeah, definitely in 2025, there will also gain opportunities for new buyers, absolutely. I think the, 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 we have to differentiate. Uh, we have the investment, uh, um, uh, the investments and then you have the product developments. Uh, the the construction loan environment is is uh, heavily under under pressure and and, and in attention. That's where we will see and that we are already seeing the first uh, um, uh, defaults. The second uh, uh, line will be the the investments uh, uh, into older uh, real estate and uh, those cash flows who cannot cope with the yeah. capex requirements and and the rest will will manage. But those are the Basically, the, the two uh, sectors where it's the, where the tension is most palatable. And I suppose, how do you deal with those? You know, let's say they're on your loan book, or they're coming back for you in terms of financing for an asset that does require capex in order to get it up to standard. Um, what happens with that? Is that something where that's something that the bank supports? Is it something where it's really going to be more? kind of specialized financing coming in in order to specifically you know pay for that transition what's everybody's i think that's that's the space where uh, the private debt has its uh, justification and, and you know to to um, increase the capital value of the or protect the capital value of, of that investment um, rather than for for the for the financial institutions to to jump in because that's a sort of uh, an entrepreneurial risk that we it's not a role to take yeah and, and do you find, do you get rewarded if it's a more green, if you're borrowing on a more green asset, is that rewarded in terms of the financing side, Duco? What's the... Rewarded? Um, I think we need to make a distinction between, let's say, asset level backed debt, I think, uh, which, which likely will result into a green loan in case it ticks all the boxes. To me, we are not far away from a real black or white scenario. It needs to be a green building on day one, or it needs to be a brown to green uh, uh, building. So at least the strategy needs to be there. That is including the business plan and obviously also the cash to support that. So I think that the, the banks are really being pushed by the central banks. Uh, they have their strategy now towards ESG loans. They're really increasing their the, the number of green loans in their portfolios. 
and um, that really came to life uh, in the market. Now on fund level, you clearly have sustainable financings with KPIs that suits a strategy. Is there a benefit? Well, it's more like five to 10 basis points margin, so to say. So it's, in my view, still an immaterial effect. Um, uh, but yeah, again, green, I, yeah. If, if I may add to that, I mean, you, you um, I would just, I would, wouldn't contradict you on anything any of that. I just want like to um, emphasize, um, we're on, a, on our way that um, buildings that are not green or not um, manageable to green will not be financeable anymore. Yeah. And that's, that's, the, that's the effect, not so much about pricing. Uh, you could argue that the, the, is it more a, a discount than a, than a bonus or wh whatever, but it's yeah. just, uh, we're heading towards yeah. that At black and level, white. I, I fully agree. Yeah. Yeah. At this level, I fully agree. I, yeah. If I may, it's beyond financeable. I think the risk of obsolescence is very high. Yeah. And it's no longer just financeable. Occupiers will not want them either. So exactly. I think it's, it's a much bigger shift in mentality and that comes at the price. Uh, whether there is a premium for that, I think that's secondary. I think yeah. it's something that needs to be done to be future-proof. I think that's an that's a exponential pressure coming into the market, yeah. coming from the, from the uh, tenants, tenants, from, from the equity, and from the lenders. Yeah. I think I, I agree with that, but I think all fair points, but any green initiative is inflationary. If you're now in the market where nobody has money and returns are tight, to then spend money on the green initiatives, I think that's unlikely. And if you see the governments, Germany and UK, walking back on all the targets and green initiatives, I think that's massively exaggerated and overhyped. No. I think it needs to be, it needs <laughs> to happen, but if you, for example, WP Carry, we buy a chemical plant, how can you make that green? It, it yeah, applies well. to a certain type of real estate, but not all real estate market. And then it's very, very inflationary. So if you think, okay, now I want to buy asset that is green, that's going to be a lot more you know, efficient, but then the yield is going to be a lot more tired on that because it's going to cost more money. But how can you make the numbers work if, if it's inflationary, the rate is going to keep going up. If the rate is going to go up, the numbers won't work. So always, all, any green initiative, the numbers need to work. If the numbers don't work, it, you, you, got, like, you hit the wall. I comment on this, if I may. I can tell you, yes, but... There is increasingly growing number of investors that are prepared to take a lower return in order to do what needs to be done. So I think it all depends. And if you learn from equity side, a lot of firms are now choosing not to invest into, you know, production plant or fireworks or whatever there may be, because it's no longer compliant. So I think we're changing mindset. It's not just about reporting, it's actually actioning on it. Do I have a clear vision on everything? No, but I think it's going to be important, increasingly more important, and the financial and the ESG metrics will rebalance. It's not going to be just about getting the best returns. No, it's, I don't disagree yeah. with that. And I think yeah. that that's real now. It's not a I, question anymore. And may I add to that? I, I, I agree. I, I think uh, um, when it comes to this uh, uh, risk uh, of uh, overcharging the economy with uh, ESG requirements, uh, we have to differentiate again. There are different political um, tensions concerning each segment, and in, in the order of, of of the of increasing tension, I would say you have um, probably the residential part is in in a, a really a very political issue, and you might have some leniency from the legislator on on that. Then the the industry and production sides, and the last. The weakest link of, of all these three segments is the, the tertiary sector, retail, office, etc. Uh, I mean, if they can't uh, get to the, to the targets in the residential sector, which makes 80% of, uh, uh, of the buildings that we deal with, they will have to be very strict on the office. Yeah. Um, I wanted to pick up, you, you mentioned some of the sectors there, and I'm conscious of, of, of time. And, and I wanted to pick up on some of those sectors in terms of both from, I, I guess, the investment and the finance side, because everybody's looking at, at assets and sectors in a similar way, because you've all got to analyze risk and, and potential return from it. Um, so there, are there asset classes that you are keener to lend on uh, or to borrow on or to invest in because they are more resilient in this type of market? 
Um, does anybody want, I mean, is there a view on offices? Obviously, a, a poor view from the US, but different market here. Retail beginning to appear back on the radar, for example. Um, a lot of focus on some of the more niche sectors. Um, but but I, I guess what's, what's, what's your view in terms of the sectors and in this current market? What we definitely hear today and the, the, these two days at Expo is that resi and logistics is still the flavor of the day. I think that's the case for CRE investment management, but basically across the market. Now, the sentiment for offices is quite uh, debated. Uh, I think that's, that's uh, not always from a realistic risk perspective, but really coming from the things that are happening in the US, which are affecting now the sentiment in Europe. Um, Retail, I fully agree with you, Richard. I think the sentiment for retail is absolutely increasing. We see in our portfolio, but also across the market, that, that retail, and that's basically from high street to, to shopping centers to convenience, that valuations are holding up. The return is, 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 is quite strong, definitely compared to other sectors, but uh, it's mainly driven by, uh, by an income return, uh, mostly income return. So yeah, I would say this calendar year, uh, it's hard to ring a bell on a specific day, but this, this, this calendar year, it's, it, retail is definitely back on the radar for more, more and more parties. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And are there things you are not lending against and things that you think, great, that's a great deal. I'm so delighted it's come in. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, first of all, it's scary, but I do agree again with the Duco. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know what's Are you planning. lending to them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to sit you at opposite ends next time. <laughs> yeah, probably so. But I w what I would like to add, though, is that it's not so much about asset types as such as uh, where in the cycle they stand. And we, I mentioned that the, the correction in office yields, for example, is not over yet. Yep. Uh, so that's, that's uh, uh, a case where we w are, um, are looking at with a little bit of caution. But other than that, we still like uh, office, so don't worry. Um, the, 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 there are a few asset classes that we don't lend against, which is, uh, for example, um, data centers. Yeah. And that's also because of, of uh, the fact that I can't imagine any data center being really green and, <laughs> and being compliant with our creme path. So uh, um, that's where ESG kicks in and where we, where we have to select uh, part of the market. Um, but other than that, yeah, our strategy didn't really um, change uh, fundamentally uh, from before. And Out of interest, data centers purely because of ESG or for other reasons as well? Um, part of the, 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 the answer is the technical risk. Uh, we, I, I'm, I'm capable of foreseeing the technical um, uh, evolution of those data centers. But part of it is also, yeah, because it's just a massive... Uh, um, uh, user of, of energy. Do you see many of your clients where you're kind of pushing the hand that you should sell some of your assets to amortize the debt, but not yet? Excuse me again? Do you see any of your clients where you think, oh, I think, tell, do you tell any of your clients that you think you should sell some of your assets because you should amortize some of your debt? But it's, it's their de decision to take usually, uh, so, um, <laughs> but uh, I mean... In theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, if, if 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 they're on the, if they they uh, if they're short on the cash flow and there are certain requirements to to fulfill, they need to be to be uh, active and looking for a solution, and, and that might that be you know the sale of their property. Yeah. yeah. And is that already you see that already visible in the market? Some of them, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but not but not a whole lot. So no, no, no. Uh, don't uh, get your hopes too high. <laughs> 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 um, I wanted to pick up uh, just just briefly on loan to value, those kinds of things, because um, obviously there's, if, if we look at the, you know, the equity markets, for example, you know, it's, it's difficult to find buyers and sellers at the, at the right pricing because it's difficult to know how to underwrite the values at the moment. And for sure, we believe those may well settle, which might solve that. But how do you deal with things like, you know, an asset that may well be, you know, you might have a loan to value here of it when it was, when the loan was done, but actually it's gonna strand now here, potentially. Um, so how do you, because it's very difficult then to put in more CapEx, keep that loan to, you know. So how, you know, have you had to adjust your thoughts about how you're looking at it, whether that's, you know, moving to a different way of, of looking at debt? Um, that's a difficult question, because it really depends on case by case. It's, uh, if there is cash flow, then, uh, we can manage through the, through the situation. It's not about LTVs so much. 
Yeah. But if uh, if there's no cash flow, then you know, then that's a whole different set of uh, uh, problems that we face. And then the 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 question is: Is the client is our client capable of putting some additional uh, cash on the table, or will he bring a joint venture partner into the game, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? That that's and and maybe even a, a sale would would be yeah. the, the best way to deal with it. Okay, good. But you you would then look rather than necessarily just a strict loan to value. You'd look at how the debt is yielding and uh, and what's happening in terms of cash Absolutely. flows and Absolutely. okay. I mean the the LTVs. Um, eat up our, our risk-weighted assets, so we, in theory we will have to make it more expensive. But it's not so much a, a, a risk vector, it's, uh, it's, all, it's um, something we look at, but the, now the, 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 the cash is king. I mean, cash flow is decisive on how stable that investment will evolve. Great, very good. And cash is king, I think, is an interesting one because certainly there's been a lot of focus on um, certainly a lot of equity in the market and then refinancing you know off the back end of that um, rather than doing it initially so really interesting um, we've come up against our time um, really interesting discussion lots that I can take through into the next session as well which is around implementing ESG strategies because I know that there's already questions from people around the finance and I promised that I would take some of the things from this through to it um, Thanks very much to, to everybody for joining us. Thanks also um, to everybody joining uh, the live stream and the on-demand um, from, from Expo Real. Um, and because we're all here, we can all say um, thank you very much for being here. And if you could join me in thanking the speakers, that would be great. Thanks very much, everybody.